What up, everybody? It's the classic movie section of our evening, our thir the third section of our movie discussion marathon that happens every two weeks or so here at the No Name Cinema Society. And part three is always a classic movie discussion. And quite frankly, it's it's my favorite and the most popular. Um, that you know that that's the, no surprise. I'm Jonathan Betzler. You can see my Twitter handle right here. Um, and tonight, as you may have figured out, it's Christmas time, um, so we're going to talk about Miracle on 34th Street. Uh, and we are joined by Santa himself for this. Here's uh, Santa J. Money, uh, one of my uh, guests here. How you doing, uh, Santa? Ho, 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 JB. That's how I'm <laughs> doing. I'm filling the hose. That, what else is new? You, you, that's what you call Monday night. <laughs> Davey is embarrassed, uh, apparently, <laughs> by our jokes. Welcome back, Davey, to the Classic Movie Discussion. This is your least favorite part of the night. Is that right? That is. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's my least favorite. Favorite? Favorite? I don't know. I like it. I, it's a good time. It's a good time. <laughs> he's such he, he's such a nice guy and says all the right things, unlike me and Jay Money. He's not a nice guy. Is that what that's all about? <laughs> he has never seen a Christmas movie before, so I'm pretty sure this was a new experience for him in general. Wow. Yep. Davey, how do you respond to that? Uh, Tangerine is my new favorite Christmas movie. Tangerine. There you go. <laughs> Well, that is a movie I'll be seeing as part of the Spirit Award screenings in January. So, yeah, uh, so can't say anything about it. So, talk about that another time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, in the meantime, uh, many of you may have seen our trivia question on Facebook and Twitter, which was le leading up to tonight's movie, tonight's discussion. And the trivia question was, uh, you know, uh, which character? There's a certain character that had been that has been portrayed on screen more times than any other character. Although in this movie is the only time anyone won an Oscar for it, so obviously uh, the character played portrayed more, and more times than any other character in movie history is Santa Claus, uh, which which you probably guessed, but you may not have known that uh, Edmund Gwynn's supporting actor Oscar for Miracle on 34th Street is the only time anyone won an Oscar for playing Santa Claus. Um, Davey, do you have any guesses as to what move? What are the other characters that are most portrayed in film history? I nope. told I told uh, Jay Money already. I, I mean I, I, I can think of like a villain like Hitler or something. I, I can't think of uh, Hitler's number six, I believe. Okay, uh, that's that's. He went to villains first, though. Interestingly, your first thought was Hitler. Did, did he's he's not wrong to go to villains first. <laughs> he needs to think a little grander. God uh -huh. is God one of them? Uh, God's number five. Okay, right ahead, right ahead of Hitler. But you're um, on the you're on the right track. Now think what you just said and villains at the same time. Devil, the devil. Devil's number two. That is correct. <laughs> All right. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. I think. Uh, uh, Jay Money, you want to film in three and four? Uh, it's the Easter Bunny and Richard Nixon, I believe. Nope. Uh, Grim Reapers. He just doesn't remember. Grim Reapers number three and Jesus Christ is number four. Uh, exactly and on that note, let's start talking about Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. Um. So most people know the plot of this movie. Um, most of, I mean, like many of you have already seen it. Although when we screened it this past Friday, uh, this past Saturday rather, at Jay Money's apartment, I might add, um, that's right. One of the group had not seen it before. Um, but anyway, Doris Walker, who you see there, portrayed by Mar Maureen O'Hara, she works for Macy's in New York City. Um, and a drunk Santa, the morning of the Thanksgiving Day parade, forces her to hire a new one at the last minute. Little does she know that she turns out she's hiring the actual Santa Claus, or at least so he claims. Um, the rest of the movie tests the faith of everyone involved. Involved is he is Santa Claus real, and is this gentleman the real deal? Um, so, Davey, had you seen this before tonight? Before watching it for this uh, broadcast? Yes, of course I'd seen it before. <laughs> I, well, it's not a, it's not it's not a joke. Like a, you know, Jay Money didn't one of our group did not not see it before. Yeah, yeah, but he also hates Christmas, so it's fine. He's got to he be younger. Not, he's, not hate Christmas. he's watching right now. He doesn't hate Christmas. Sorry. He no. knows who he is. He's younger than us, though, right? He's got to be. Uh, no, he's our age. But how, so, so what? <laughs> how do you? Uh, how how was it upon rewatching it, Davey? It was great. It was great, and um, you know, it, it had been a while. It's probably six years or so since I'd seen it uh, last. So no, I, I I I was happy to do it. I did it today. So yeah, it was a good time. <laughs> Nothing like a last-minute uh, screening. Um, Jay Money, I know how you feel, but do you want to reiterate it for the audience? Sure. I mean, I, I certainly enjoy this movie. I've seen it many times. I, you know, I think that's a hallmark of any good uh, holiday classic that regardless of maybe some of the details about, uh, you know, how culturally relevant it might be or at least about, like, um, you know, modern interpretations of characters, it holds up 
one way or the other. It's still a charming, wonderful tale about Christmas. Yeah, I mean, I obviously agree with that, but, uh, well, before I say that, that I mean, like, I, usually I, I tell you what the feedback from the screening was, and uh, the, I was asked not to record this particular f uh, discussion, so I don't have the audio to back me up, but uh, it was surprising that the group was sort of mixed. Um, in, and, you know, I, one, you know, like one group, one sort of sect said that it was a great script with the great ideas. Uh, they, they were really impressed with the screenplay in particular. They were focused on that. Um, others found it slow and boring. Uh, and so I was a little surprised by that, including the, the person that, uh, that had not seen it before. Um, and I, I will say, though, in, in rewatching it, I did feel like it was a little slower than it needed to be. And, you know, we've seen 40s films before. Uh, you know, we were going to talk about another 40s film later during the bracket discussion that, you know, this film is, you know, uh, like it lingers on its, uh, you know, like it, it, for a comedy, in its comic moments, it doesn't punch jokes, you know, the way you'd like it to. And it's a little slowly paced. It lingers on shots maybe a little too long, unnecessarily so. Um, and that's a minor flaw in otherwise lovely movie. And I think the key to what makes the film work so so well is the first thing on, on, on my you know outline here, and that is emotional engagement. What does the film do to you know affect? Because I cried several times even on Saturday, um, and yeah. Jay Money made fun of me. Uh, yes, so um, what what does the film do, guys? That that makes it work? Like specifically, if we had to break it down. How does Miracle in 34th Street, what is it, the director, screenwriter, the same person, what do they do to, uh, or performances, how do they affect us? Uh, well, I mean, I, you know, I think that it really does come down to the performances in some ways. I, I think that uh, you, you can't uh, deny the, the lovability of the characters in this, especially watching Natalie Wood uh, going from sort of the, the doubter she becoming uh, involved emotionally with the idea of, the, of this character, uh, who is, by the way, never really totally clarified whether or not he actually is Santa Claus. He still could possibly be this just wonderful old man. You're, you're jumping topics on us, though. But we, we, well, I just want to say, I, just, I wanted to use it just to point out the fact that Natalie Wood is going through a process, and, and the audience itself is enjoying Natalie Wood's process of opening up, of, of sort of like becoming aware of the idea of imagination and of, of, of enjoying... Yeah. Um, of just having joy in her life and uh, Gwen's performance is really playing off that in a really satisfying way. So I think those are the things, like the two real big elements in this movie that really keep it together for modern audiences, ultimately. Yeah, I, I mean, and I you, I did want to talk about performances, so maybe we'll jump to that. Um, but before we do, Davey, like, what do you think it is that makes this movie work? I, you know, I, I think I think part of what, what really makes it um, makes it an emotional movie is the stakes are, are, are kind of crazy high. Um, you know, In terms of a sanitarian point of view? Yeah, I mean, like, th I mean, this guy is, uh, at one point he gets a little disappointed and he puts him, he literally puts himself in the nut house. And, um, and then... Well, you know, he doesn't put himself in the nut house, he, he just... Well, he throws the exam. Refuses to, refuses to get out, but yeah. Uh, yeah, but he, but he, but his, he purposely answers the questions, uh, in, in a way as to get himself committed, which is, yeah. I mean, it, it's... It's. I mean, and you're and you're worried about him. You're 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 worried about him, and and, and you you uh he's such a lovable guy. It's so you're it's, invested in in uh, yes. Chris Kringle in general. Now, is it something that because he's Santa Claus, or something Edmund Gwen specifically does, or the writer specifically does in painting this character? You know, when you're when you're a kid uh, and you see this movie as a child, it's it's because he's Santa Claus. There's no question. Um, but as an adult. It's you can appreciate the performance and in, in, uh, he he just he just does such an amazing job. Uh, you as a man as an adult you 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 feel for him and you want him to be all right. So that's there's two performances that you guys have sort of honed in on here and I, I, the previous still I showed was uh, uh, the two of them together. So let, let let's talk about them individually real quick uh, and sort of break this down a little further. I think Jay Money's on point to some degree because. You know, this is this is Natalie Wood here, uh, and there is, you know, the best moments of the movie, as in rewatching it, were moments that played out on her face. Mm. Uh, uh, and you know, the moment when she tugs his beard, the moment when she watches him speak Dutch, and the moment at the very end when her mouth drops as they approach that house in Long Island. 
um, all three of those moments are the moments that really, really get me. And it, it sort of suggests that, and you know, when we talk about the Christmas top five, this might play into it more, how, how integral child actors are to these, these great emotional movies. Um, particularly, you know, Christmas movies, because, you know, Christmas and children are sort of connected. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, I think Natalie Wood, and, you know, like, I, I, you have to give director George Seaton a little credit here, too, you know, in sort of getting this performance out of her, certainly as a, what, what we found out how old she was. She was like eight or nine, wasn't she, when she made this? Yeah, I believe so. We, we did a little research. Uh, yeah. And, you know, for her to do that is, is, you know, impressive, but also for George Seaton to get it out of her too uh, is, you know, is impressive as well. So that's, so that, that's Natalie Wood. Jay Money, what? Do you, uh, Jay Money talked about her already. Uh, Davey, what do you got on Natalie? Uh, you know, I think that uh, there might have been, there might have just been some, uh, there might have been magic some luck. in that old silk hat they found. <laughs> oh, sorry. And there might have been some luck involved uh, getting uh, this child actress who obviously had incredible talent and would end up being a, a great actress um, as well, you know. So, it's, yeah, I, I just I echo all the sentiments. Natalie Wood, she was great. <laughs> I, would, well, I, you know, I would go so far as to say that maybe she was already experienced with disappointment at that point in her life so that she knew how to really telegraph it very effectively. Oh, my gosh. Because I, I honestly think that half this movie is about Natalie Wood throwing shade to Santa Claus. I mean, she had some of the best <laughs> sort of snarkiest eyebrows you will see in any Christmas movie, maybe in cinema in general. Well, it, you're going to make me... I have, another, I have another photo prepared for that that I... Oh, I hope so. I hope so. She has a wonderful sort of like, what What are you talking about face. Oh, wow. I, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I mean, resting bitch face. She has nailed it already at this point in her career. You know? <laughs> like, it's fantastic. <laughs> I, mean, I was not prepared for that right. photo. I had another photo pulled up because I wanted a segue, but since you brought it up, I, well, I had but to... I think that you know, I think that that gives her character a serious weightiness that you wouldn't necessarily find in other sort of child actors, and I think that is a large part of the pull between her and, and uh, uh, you know Chris Kringle as a character is that you you get to see them playing off each other and you get to see them sort of you know understanding each other in different ways. Well, and also was, her, him breaking her down the way he does, you know, like subtly, he's not pushy, like, and that's no, a but, test of his screenplay. But he's just affected by her. Like, you know, he go, he goes through a, a serious moment of self doubt because of the way that she is playing off him as well. So, I, I think in a lot of ways this movie holds Isn't up. Isn't the self the self doubt had more to do with Doris? I think. Uh, well, you think so? I mean, because I mean, well, ultimately, I mean, it, was, it was very specifically related to the fact that she didn't believe him. You know, like she yeah. saw, she was aware of his commitment and 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 had agreed to it. And therefore, you know, that's what really broke his spirit. Yeah, but but his ultimate uh, gambit in this in this film was to uh, tag team the entire family with uh, with John Payne uh, as uh, Fred. Uh, what's his face as a lawyer? Uh, you know, he was after uh, Natalie Wood to make her believe again. Hayden, Fred um, um, yeah, no, but I mean, like in the sanitarium, like he specifically says she did not believe in me. Like, no, David, no, back I, me up. You just watched this an hour ago. No, I know. It's, it, it's the kind of thing where I think that that was a feather, but ultimately I think that it's it's his relationship with her is what kind of crushes him for a while. Yeah, but, David Joe. No, I think okay. I think that's true. I think that the, the fact, I think that the fact that he isn't um, he isn't getting where he, he wants to go, um, and he, he's kind of disappointed about how that's going, and it and it he he falls back and and, and definitely puts himself in a bad spot. But I mean, again, I mean, it's like we watch a different movie. It was specifically related to Doris. It was like so. I mean, you can't even make that, it any clearer than they made it. That, that one conversation was specifically related to Doris. Was it about Doris? That's and the other Jack? conversation oh, where he lost spirit. That's the only. No, that's the only point in the movie no, where he you're, lost. You're right. Spirit. You're right. It you is. Want to say anything else beyond it, JB? Then I don't know what to tell you. But I mean, obviously, there were a lot of factors at play here with Santa Claus, with Chris Kringle losing his faith in the idea of himself as. Not really at all. Like I don't. I mean, like you're adding. You once again, and we're gonna to get to this later on. You're adding stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know why you wouldn't even acknowledge it. What I'm saying, but okay. You are, but I'm, but I, there was one only one point in the movie where he loses his spirit, and it's directly related to Doris. Because the fact of the matter is, Susan, Natalie Wood character, she she breaks much sooner. You know what I mean? And by the time he loses spirit, you know he, you know she's she's fine. It's it's. You know, it's the Doris character that that's the tough nut to crack for him. Yeah, and he, he even where, says that. 
Yeah. He, he, he even says, like, I, I thought I was getting no, somewhere. I, he says and... I mean, like, I will agree that it's, it's the relationship between... The, the What makes the movie work, I think, is the relationship between Susan and Chris. I mean, like, that's the heart of the movie, without a doubt, for me, which is why it's now the poster, whereas the original poster was Maureen O'Hara and John Payne together, uh, if you recall. Um, yeah. The heart of the movie is them, without a doubt, and they're the best performances, and, you know, like, I don't have any doubt about that, but, I mean, like, to specifically say that, that that's what, I mean, like, he only has, there's only one moment where he loses his spirit, and I, I think it's directly it's related. Here's why. There's an entire build-up before that point about him facing all these rejections. I mean, it's not just about that. It's about him dealing with the psychologist. It's about him dealing with uh, the other side character's name. I can't remember the, the younger man who was trying to play Santa Claus. Albert. It's about him facing the challenge that Natalie Wood's character gives to him about, about certain things. There's all these things that he's up against where he has to try to prove himself. To be specific, what happens with, I mean, like, you're not making any sense to me. Okay. Like, well, I, think, like I, I honestly think you're just making stuff up. All right. Why? Well, are you I getting think, testy now? I think I think that uh, I think that you can make the uh, the argument that um, that that the, the certainly the Maureen O'Hara um, that that was the straw that broke the camel's back. But I think that the cumul cumulative effect of of how difficult it was to to break down Natalie Wood, uh, I I think I think that there's something there. I think that it I think it was it was all of that because he. How, she, she wasn't that difficult at all. Oh I mean, come like, on, really? I know. I mean, like, by the look. I mean, like, he just wove his little magic spell. I mean, like, it was sweet and it was lovely, and, sure. and you know, he just needed to speak a little Dutch. Yeah, you know? I mean, you know, she, you know, she was talking about how the the, the kids were. He had her jumping around like a monkey. He you did, know, but not, not right away. He had that. He had to work. It to wasn't get that there. long. It wasn't that long. I mean, I don't. I, I mean, like, I don't know what you're talking about at all. And you're gonna make it seem like I'm an idiot. But I mean, like, <laughs> it's. No, fuck you, because it's so clear to me. It, it, it's it's like it's not even debatable. It's like you're 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 pulling stuff out of the air and making it up because. Well, then I guess we should move on. Because it's there is one moment when he loses his spirit. There's only one where he's he's self he's self deprecating and self defeating uh, and and imp, uh, almost self imploding, and it is directly related to Doris and like Susan had nothing to do with it by that time in the at the screenplay Susan is all in no that's true that's true she is all in at that point in time i th i well, think I mean, not. I, he's not all in at that time you know all right well so now we got we got three <laughs> three well, divergent I mean, like, opinions how what do you, like do you do you remember the movie or just forgetting is this early alzheimer's setting I mean, in or what's going on throughout the entire broadcast JB. that's your prerogative but we can also talk about this rationally for a second Okay, please. I mean, like, I, I have yet to, like, uh, every point you've made, it seems completely fabricated, and, like, it's like you watch a different movie. How is it no, exactly, how is it fabricated? I don't because believe that she's like, it, 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 There is no scene, there is nothing to suggest that, I mean, there's no other moments, no other moments in the movie where only he loses his spirit. Only and that's part, of, that's part of his, his joy, is his, it's eternal faith, and there's one moment when he loses faith. And it's so, I mean, like, they make such a big deal of that being one moment. We're talking about a slow buildup of him losing faith because of a lot of different extenuating factors. There's a moment where he breaks because of what happened with Dorith, Doris, but he's up against other factors as well. And Natalie Wood, by the way, her character as Susan doesn't actually become fully you know, faithful to the idea of Santa Claus until the very end, until she finally sees the wish that she hoped no, for. No, I disagree with that. I think she's totally on board when she doesn't get the thing Christmas. There's a red herring thing where she doesn't get exactly what she wants Christmas morning, and she... She goes back, she takes a few steps back, and then it's back. Guess we disagree. Mm -hmm. Well, what else is new? Um, <laughs> but, I mean, like, I, st I, I just want to understand this other thing. And it is my prerogative to discuss this further. So, I don't think you can understand. What's that? I don't think you can understand. I think we should just move on. So are you calling me an idiot right now? No, I'm saying that I don't really think there's a reason to keep going. Are you over saying that I didn't have the capacity to understand this made-up stuff? I think it's a small point, and it doesn't really matter in the long scheme. Why don't we continue? Yeah, you're saying that it? because you don't have anything. You don't like. You don't have a, a, a solid ground to stand on, and so instead of making no, me that's seem like absolutely not true, JB. I mean, I well, think I, he's, mean, I think I think he's. We've you both staked out your your stance, and we're kind of at an impasse. I mean, but I don't. I, I. I mean, like, I'm so flabbergasted by it. Like, I don't even like. It doesn't even make any sense. Like, Why are you so flabbergasted? It's a minor point. Why are you flabbergasted about it? We because both agree that we 
like because this movie. What's that? We both agree that we like this movie. I don't know why you're getting so flustered by this. I'm not. I'm not flustered. I'm. I'm confused as to why you would you would make such a big deal out of this. I'm making a big deal about this because you're fucking attacking me. Like, let's just move on. I'm not attacking you. I'm not even remotely attacking you. I'm trying to understand, and you have yet you to make a solid point. Like, and you're 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 oh like you're saying nothing that is actually happening in the movie. Well, no, I don't, well, well, he, he's 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 said things that happened in the movie. I mean, there are I mean, not related. To, like the whole his point was that Susan is related to his moment of of breaking down. And what I said is, was that there were a lot of factors that led up to him breaking down. Doris is the one thing that broke the camel's back, but he is going through a lot of things at the same time. I, why are we still going over this? It's a minor point in the movie. I, I, I don't think we, that's true at all. It's not a minor point. It's a large point, I think. Um, well, the other thing that we argued about uh, on, on the show is Jay Money feels like that, uh, not in the show, at the screening, is that there was a there was rampant... Uh, sexism in this movie, um, mm. and so we wanted to get get Jay uh, Davy Joe in this, um, and I can't find the picture that I want, but regardless, I'll go with this one. Um, so, Jay Money, do you want to talk about this at all? Well, I mean, I, yes, I would say that it it certainly isn't you know out. It's not like it's uh, unexpected for the time. It's just Certainly not expected for the the morales of the time. It's it's certainly acceptable within the context of what they were talking about for for that time period. In a modern audience sort of way, I mean, it's about a guy that sort of stalks a single mother and her daughter in a relatively creepy way, uh, where he sort of co-ops himself into the family, sort of tries to take control of the way that she parents, and then sort of undermines her to you know supersede what she's just, you know what she wants as a parent. You know whether or not you could say that his pursuit was noble, whether or not you could say that you know. It's ultimately about trying to inspire joy in this child. That's not really the point. It's, it's really more about the fact that this movie ended up sort of belittling Maureen O'Dowd's character in a lot of ways. Uh, is it the kind of thing that turns me off to the movie? No, I don't think it is. It's the kind of thing that's just a texture of the culture of the time, and it's fine to put up with. It's a little amusing to see some of the scenes nowadays, but it certainly didn't change things for me on a whole. Um, and my point was, I, I agree certainly with the creepy factor. Like there was certainly some, you know, seemingly you know borderline behavior in terms of the way he he sort of interloped the, his way into their lives, uh, and that is that that's some questionable choices. And I also agree that it doesn't affect my overall enjoyment of the film. What where uh, the statement that you didn't exactly make just now, maybe you sort of made it that you made the other day that I disagreed with was that he tried to you know, that John Payne is subversively trying to make her into, you know, the typical American housewife, uh, you know, of the of the time period. Because, you know, there's, there's a couple things that were sort of, you know, progressive about uh, Marina Harris' character. You call her Marina O'Dowd just now. But uh, there's, ah. there's, there was something that was sort of progressive, you know, we talked that we did talk about on Saturday. One, that she's a divorcee. Two, that she's, you know, a fairly high-ranking businesswoman. Um, and both of those things were sort of progressive. And... You were suggesting that in in his in his efforts to make her believe in something, he was also trying to get her to, you know, to, you know, demasculine, you know, emasculate her in some way and make her more of the traditional female figure, uh, you know, uh, that with less power. And that's where uh, that's where I felt like uh, you that you went astray in your point. And or that's the that's the key argument that I disagreed with. Um, you didn't necessarily say that. In, in so many words just now, do you feel it less than you did on Saturday? Well, I, I don't think it's... Again, no, I... Did I, mis what did I, I misrepresent what you meant? No, in some ways, I, I think you're taking this to a natural conclusion that I don't know if I necessarily voiced as strongly on Saturday uh, in general, but, yeah, I think ultimately he is trying to take this woman who he sees as having her life broken up by some sort of unfortunate circumstance and put her back into a situation which is very acceptable for... Men and women at that time period to be in this, you know, loving family household, whatever. But he's definitely calling the shots. I mean, he always makes it pretty clear from the get-go that he is the one that thinks this is what she should be doing. And even if she disagrees with him, he's willing to undermine her capacity for that and, and do whatever he wants with her daughter. I mean, I don't <laughs> think there's anything malicious behind it. I don't think right. that there's anything like that should be, you know. I, I think that you're saying two different things because I, I'm not really criticizing the movie for this. It's certainly not like the problem. Well, I'm I have not saying you are, but I, but I, but you you do seem you said from a modern prism. It seems like there's a suggestion that her 
to her career, uh, having being a career woman is is not what's appropriate for women of the time. It's it, it you know I don't know if that's what you're suggesting. Is that the, what the movie's saying? Uh, no, I, I don't think it's so much about being a career woman as much as being independent. I think that he is ultimately trying to get her to conform to being within you know a household situation. It's not really a big problem for me. Uh, it, it's charming the way that they have their flirtations back and forth. This movie is a lot of mansplaining from his point of view. It's a lot of him saying, like, this is what should be happening. This is what you should be doing with your daughter. You know, you should really open up your heart. And in a way, that makes a lot of sense for the for the character in general. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it, it really is this guy who's kind of a stranger, who's kind of a neighbor, who basically says, I know what's best for you, and you should probably do this. Well, I, I mean, like, I agree with a lot of that, but the, the, the where I feel like it stops is this idea, like, yes, he's doing a lot of mansplaining. Yes, I feel like he's, inter, you know, like, he's sort of out of line a lot of times, um, but, I, but I don't, like, it's not like he ever, you know, like, just because they're moving into a house and they want to get married at the end, something she wants to does not necessarily, you know, make her less of a modern woman. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think that... Uh, she has a prerogative, to, and you know, it's not like he asked her to leave her job or right. or any sort of those suggestions. Right. I mean, and his goals to make her believe, you know, and have faith in things more and things like that. I don't think makes her less of, you know, you know, make makes her more of that traditional '40s woman that you know, like that women have been trying to you know escape that that. Stereotype. I don't. I don't think that they go hand in hand. Um, I agree with the creepy neighbor element, um, but I, where I where I where I don't agree is that it's some sort of anti-feminist film in that way. I, I I'll tell you that the 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 one major uh, the one thing that I felt was sexist was uh, and this is this is awesome because it's a completely different thing. Um, when he <laughs> takes he takes Kringle's case um, and he goes and tells her what he's done. All of a sudden, she she flips out. She's like, "Oh, we, you're you're jeopardizing your career. We're, you know, this is this is crazy. Why why would you do that? Like, she's this executive at Macy. She doesn't need him. She, I mean, for for uh, I think it kind of it kind of that's I a really was, good point. We hadn't thought of that, or at least I didn't the other day. I think that the the, the, the I, I just feel like she, the the. The thing that she could have done, they could have made her be get right behind him and say, you know what, you're right. This is great that you're doing this. Um, and instead, they had to play the damsel in distress. Oh my God, who's going to provide for me? When it was completely unnecessary. Mm. Yeah, so that that's I think I think that's the one thing that kind of got me. I, I, I they didn't need to do that, and that was that was I think they were they're were like, whoa, this this woman's a little too strong. Let's 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 back off on that. And, that's uh, a really good, and it's you know it's a really good point, and I and it, it had that scene hadn't occurred to me, and it, you're right, it's an unnecessary scene, and that goes back to my pace issues. There's there's some other scenes that seem kind of unnecessary, like I think we even said it at the time, the bubblegum scene. You know, I, mm. I think as the movie was going, we're like, what's the we sort of looked at each other, what's the point of that? And and it was also slow, and it didn't add up to much. Um, do you guys know what I'm talking about? I uh, well, I guess I really enjoy that scene, but oh. okay, sure. You don't remember people talking about it? Like, did I make make? Uh, did I was just say uh, well, that? Well, I, I honestly don't remember people talking about it, but I, I can understand why it is because it's a relatively superfluous scene. I just I just love how they show Santa Claus himself, sort of, or Chris Pringle, uh, sort of becoming aware of what is more modern things happening within children's culture. Ultimately, yeah, it was also like poorly executed. Like, it, it could have been a little tighter, and and like there was fades to black within it that was no, just no, that's, sort of that's definitely awkward. true. But I, you know, I think that for me, it almost it really helped sort of signify the the childish spirit that he had, the the sort of sense of innocence that they were really trying to push, which you know, also helps sort of explain his character in a lot of ways. So I I see why it fits in. I you know, for, it's funny because I actually I've often thought about this scene just in general over my life because it is a scene that really does not fit within the the bigger context of what we're talking about, and it's it's such an interesting like sort of like outside tangent almost, and that's why I remember it so much, and maybe that's why I like it so much. You know, maybe because it doesn't seem like it's so, I don't know, it doesn't it doesn't relate to anything else that's really happening in the movie. That it's I, not part of the it's not part of the A to B to C structure of you know exactly. A to B to C. It's something that I, I guess I've enjoyed seeing so. I mean, I can see that. I, it just felt maybe too tangential, like yeah. it, you know, and, and you know, work like those. I'm, I, it's another thing I'm sensitive to, like working in the field and like you know, like feeling when a screenplay goes astray. It's like what you know, like it feels wrong, like in your gut to me. Um, so uh, a couple things that Jay Money sort of alluded to, or maybe it was David Joe. I don't remember at this point. Oh, it was, it was Jay Money because I said asked him to put a pin in it, um, and that is. 
uh, one of the things that one of the things that I think the uh, chief things that the screenplay accomplishes is is merging Santa into the real world and and, mm-hmm. and all that you know oh and we even talked about Edmund Gwen at all like we co- totally missed it but um uh, immer- making Santa feel real and Edmund Gwen is a big part of that uh, quite frankly um, but uh, also I mean like. One thing that I thought was really interesting that I mentioned at the screening is uh, no one, Santa never gives any gifts, any free gifts anyway. He guides people to stores. Um, he arranges gifts to be made, but through purchases. Even the x-ray machine is something he paid with his bonus. There is no, like, he talks about the reindeer, but there's no suggestion that he's actually going house to house and delivering these gifts. Um, he's more of an, you know, like an enabler. Not an enabler is maybe not the right word, but it, he executes these plans. Or, or, but I mean, like, he doesn't get Tommy the football helmet. The DA has to run out and get that football helmet. And it, it sort of made Santa feel more real. And also, to Jay Money's point, they never confirm that it's Chris Kringle's the real deal. I think we all feel like he probably is, but he never actually like purchases anything. I mean, I, I mean, not really gives anything away. He just arranges for other people to get them for him, you know? Yeah, we, never, we never see any magic. And I think that's a really important part of what you're saying here. It's a except very... in his, yeah, except in his performance, you know? Well, I mean, like, unless you qualify knowing Dutch and knowing all the prices at all the different toy stores, you know, magic. He's just, you know, you just say he's well-studied. But, um, but, 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 you know, that, that is magical realism, let's call that part of it. Absolutely. So, I mean, David, what do you think about that? You know, I, it's funny is that I've I've seen this movie a number of times, and I I've always interpreted the ending as just that's it. He's he he that's the reveal. He is argument done. Yay. Um, but I, I guess I think the film I think the film ninety percent leans that way. But I think it's it was a very specific choice not to make it a hundred percent. If that's a fair statement. Okay. Yeah, no, I, Oh, I'm sorry. Am I wrong in, in in thinking that they have to actually purchase the home at the end still? They do have to purchase the oh, home yeah, at the end. Yeah, they do. He just so guides them to a place that's on sale. Another so thing, he does not give away a house. He just yeah, arranges. That's for them that's to find right. It. You're right. So basically, all he does is say, "This is the house you're looking for. Look over that way," and then they have to make. <laughs> the <laughs> these are these are not the droids you're looking for. This is the house you're looking for. Basically, Edmund Gwen is a glorified Yoda. But his and his cane is in there. Well, he was at the house. That doesn't mean he purchased it. No, no, I know, I know, but I mean, it, it just seems like he just kind of sends them in that direction, and then uh, the cane is there. Like he, I don't know. It seems there's there's some magic there. I, I, I don't. Or he well, just yeah, looks at it. Well, with magical realism, because there, you know, like yeah, it's still but possible. But I mean, like, I think by making it feel real, it it's more impactful. Like it, you know, yeah. the lack of magic yeah. makes it feel like something we encounter in our everyday lives a little more. Yeah. And the fact that we had to see an actual argument uh, that stood up in a U.S. court to rationalize the idea of the government supporting the idea of Santa Claus, as it's something that I think people could probably really appreciate because you know here again we're we're seeing a very practical end to the idea of it. You know, it's almost like we're saying we can we have the permission to believe in this now because we can we can sort of you know rationalize it through our our system, through our bureaucracy. And that's our segue to bring in our our lawyer. Um, yeah. I, that's I, there's one thing I wanted to say about that. Um, yeah. Uh, for because we have this we have an international audience and not uh, simply New Yorkers. Uh, I wanted to point out the fact that in the state of New York, the trial uh, court is called the Supreme Court, which is different from everywhere else, like in the world. And then the Supreme Court in New York is called the Court of Appeals. Ah. I mean, All right, that's a minor point, but my my question to you, Davy Joe, is it is my understanding that if this were tried genuinely, at least you know uh, in modern day, this court this case could have been thrown out as soon as the DA rested after three questions. Oh, you know, I, yeah, I mean, you can't. That's true. And then what does he does he call people again after after? Uh, no, he rests his whole case after. Are you Santa Claus? Yes, I am. I rest my case. The judge apparently could have thrown it out at that time. Is that is that correct, or am I misunderstanding that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that. Wow, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe, yeah. Wow, that's funny because I picked out a lot of stuff. Uh, the 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 little kid, the the the, the DA's kid. Tommy. Uh, that's hearsay. Daddy told me, nah, can't do that. Fair uh, point. That, 
that would have been that would have been an objection, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> the DA was too stunned to to right. remember his objections. Uh, but no, he was thinking about the football yeah. helmet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, that's a good point. I don't know. I I got you know I'm gonna watch this again. <laughs> <laughs> we were counting on you for some legal <laughs> advice. Um, so hearsay. We got the hearsay. Was there anything else? Uh, you understand that I I mean I've seen court on television. Um, but <laughs> uh, you know, I, I mean, I went to law school and passed the bar and all that, but I this is this is not a realm that I have worked in. Uh, all right, all right, all right. So, um, uh, we, we very quickly we we haven't talked about it much, um, but let's talk about Edmund Gwen himself. He did win an Oscar. Oh, that's the wrong photo. Um, he did win an Oscar for his performance. Um, and you know, you were you're, you're sort of talking about how. There's no magic, and I wonder if there's something about what he does that that's that still feels magical in spite of without actually you know a, achieving any acts of magic. I think it's a tremendous performance myself. Um, you know, in in, in a very in, and he makes it look real easy, and I, I'm not sure it is that that easy. Um, I've also seen Edmund Gwen and other things, and he's nothing like this. This is not, you know, he's just not he's not an old guy with a beard that you know just happened to fall into a good part. Um, that, that matched him, you know what I mean? So, I don't know, what do you guys, uh, how did you guys feel? I know how Jay Money feels, so let's start with Davey, real quick. Oh, no, it's, 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 a, it's a great performance, and, it's, uh, and it, it, gets, it gets right into your soul, almost. He's just, just really, uh, he really sells it. Okay. You, you, you said real quick, quick, man. You, uh, you did, you did, and I, <laughs> I, I, I took more time than I, I'm, I'm having a hard time finding my photos, so Jay Money, you go ahead. You know, I, I, what I love about his performance is the fact that he really does walk a line in between believability and between magical. I mean, we're talking about how he, he has these qualities to him where he can speak Dutch and he, he can sort of, like, know extra things that people might not know and he can see through relationships. But at the end of the day, those are all things that somebody could theoretically know, even as Doris points out. Um, he is ultimately a wonderfully genial, compassionate man. And it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think that they nail the idea that in context, in certain contexts, it's so abnormal for society that he would belong in a in a nut house ultimately. <laughs> but if you can sort of get past the idea of that, if you can get past the idea that he's you know just a man that's actually compassionate, then he is Santa Claus. He is ultimately this icon because that's what he embodies. Well, and I mean, like you made the point the other day that Edmund Gwen's performance sort of like is the definitive one. It is like not only did he win an Oscar for it, but I mean, like his. His characterization of Santa Claus has been the one that's lasted, you know, throughout time. Like it is, you know, it is exactly what what we want and expect from Santa Claus. Yeah, I think it's it's, iconic. A, it's certainly iconic. Although I, I will say that in our sound off, I'm going to talk about another Santa Claus that I actually even like more. But I will say that uh, his performance is this is this is this is where Billy, Billy, Billy Bob Thornton comes in play. That's <laughs> it. It's not Billy Bob Thornton. It'll be a surprise. But no, okay. I, I, think that Edwin, I, I think that he is the archetype for other Santas past him. I think that he really has completed the idea of Santa. As much as even, say, like, uh, Clement Clark Moore's poem completed Santa for, for American audiences at the time of that, this, is, this representation of Santa, you know, in terms of the visual representation of Santa, is in, in terms of the way he acts, is exactly the standard that we all know now. So, yeah, um, potentially a deserving Oscar winner, which is where we go to for our next segment, uh, the classic movie Showdown, um, and we are directly uh, related to our, um, you know, uh, Edmund Gwen's performance because this is about the best supporting actor bracket. I'm just, because we're a little behind on time, I'm going to skip the rules and go straight to the showdown itself. Okay. Um, I can tell you guys. Because uh, we've done the rules before. You guys have watched the show before. Um, you guys know the rules. So it's a bracket, like the NCAA bracket. And this is a second-round matchup. So I'm going to take you through the rounds and also to catch Davey up because he has no idea what's going on here. Um, we love you, Davey. Um, or at least I do. Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, so here's what we got going on. This is, this is a, so this is a second-round bracket. We've got a full frame here, and this is the way it looks. Um, so in the first round, uh, Miracle on 34th Street went up against The Life of Emil Zola, Joseph Schildkraut's performance in The Life of Emil Zola as Dreyfus from the famous Dreyfus Affair. Do you guys know the Dreyfus Affair in French history? No. Nope. Okay, well, that's... Roman Polanski is doing a movie about it, so you'll learn about it then. Um, 
So, so Joseph Shilkrop versus Emin Gwen in that bracket. And the bracket that Davey should be familiar with, because he was involved in this vote, is Unforgiven versus Walter Matthau on the fortune cookie. And you can see that vote happen in episode 11, if you guys remember that. Or 11.3 in our, in our discussion, the fortune cookie. Davey, do you remember that? I remember the fortune cookie. I don't how to vote on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're wondering how it turned out, I can tell you. Well, I know how it turned out. Are you, well, are you sure? So, yeah. Miracle on 34th Street would go on to win, beat Life of Milzola. Obviously, Miracle on 34th Street, a high seed here. Um, and that uh, now goes up against Unforgiven in the second round. Um, uh, and one thing, Jay Money, uh, maybe in the future, we'll slide round one and round two over a little bit. Because technically, round one should be on the far left. Round mm -hmm. two should be, you know what I'm saying? Uh, well, we're seeing the round two matchup now, aren't we? Anyway, we'll, we can discuss yeah, this later. Yeah, I'll show it to you later. Uh, um, but anyway, so Miracle on 34th Street versus Unforgiven. So this is the this is the vote that we did on one of the votes that we did on Saturday. Um, and the, so the votes are already in. But David, Joe, I'm curious since you've seen them both in the last year, what do you think? Uh, I think Unforgiven. 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 Dean Hackman. Unforgiven. Yeah. And why yeah. is that? Is it just uh, a modern thing? It's it's well I you know I no I I wouldn't be so crass as to say it's just the modern thing uh, I, it's Unforgiven's a movie that that has always been one of my favorites this is actually uh, the disc when I first got a DVD player this is the disc that I got uh, so it's 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 just a it's something that I've I've a movie that's always kind of kind of hit me uh, as as being a really powerful uh, piece of filmmaking and I I, I love that movie. It's a good movie, but this is, you know, so but you're saying that you feel like the performance here is better. Yes, I that I I, I Gene Hackman in that movie to me, yeah, I I, I, I do think it's better. Um, Jay Money, I happen to know that you disagree. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that because we're talking about how iconic this this character became for Miracle on 34th Street, I, I would have to give it to Evan Gwynn on that one. I, I just believe that Hackman is, is great in, this, in Unforgiven, and I also really enjoy Unforgiven quite a bit. Uh, but Hackman is great in a lot of things, and I, I don't think that he established necessarily an iconic character that lasted through the ages as much as Evan Gwynn did. So I, I give it to him. I give it to Santa Claus in the end, or Chris Kringle, uh, because I think that it has a, a lasting energy that has outlived it. Else that we're talking about right now, uh, and yeah, it, it it did go to a tie on on Saturday, but uh, no, it was it didn't go to a tie. I'm sorry, um, James broke the tie, so it uh, the winner was no. hmm. Higher Seed moves on. Miracle on 34th Street. Edmund Gwen from 1947 beats Gene Hackman from 1992, and it's it the modern movies tend to have an advantage here, so it's quite a testament to Edmund Gwen's performance that uh, he's made it to round three. So that's why that's why that uh, out of, this is Miracle on 34th Street is now in round three, which is why I want to move those those round one two things over. Okay, we we can confer on that later. Yeah. Um, I just want to prove again that Davy Joe hates Christmas. I I think that I I made the <laughs> what what and it holds up now. <laughs> I just think that the the, the 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 character that Hackman played is is uh, flawed and a little more complex to me. I, yeah. Know. Sure. She was a moralist cowboy. Uh, well, I don't know how. Co I mean, like he's. I, I mean, I, it's almost like he's the antithesis of Chris Kringle. I mean, like, yeah, you know, absolutely. like it, they're like they stand on the opposite ends of the spectrum. I think they're almost equally complex in, in the sense that not not that complex. You know what I mean? Like, well, no, I I, I, I would that say that I would say that that Gene Hackman's character is just on the other side of the spectrum, but he doesn't show lots of shades, you know what I mean? Like, he's what? fairly... I don't want to say one note, because certainly it's, it's a really strong performance. He's very interesting and fascinating, but he, you know, he's the he's the opposite end of that spectrum. Well, I think that, I think that the, the, the character that he portrays is a, is a guy that's that's conflicted. I mean, he's definitely... He's, he's, he's not conflicted. He's, he's all about the law. He's very... Uh, you know, he, he's, he, I don't it, think he's all about the law. Oh, oh, but oh, but he is because that's the only thing. There's no the moral imperative. I think is on the opposite side of him in that movie. But he says no. This is a murder. I am hunting these people down because that is the law and that is what I do. Um, and and I, I, I think, think there's more to it than that. And I, I bet you Jay Money agrees with me. Uh, stay neutral on this one. Sorry. <laughs> um. 
and he also he also I think that I think that the the um the the fact that he's very human in that movie where he's he's basically says you know I'm not I'm not really that great of a gunfighter I just I can keep my head um. And uh, but that doesn't make him more human. I mean, and it makes him honest with him. It makes him self self aware. Well, self self aware, I think is <laughs> yes. He's he's definitely he's self. aware I mean, when we see more human, I think he you know he's more dimensional, and, and he, it's not like he shows a great deal of kindness, or you know what I mean. Like it's not like you know what I mean. Like he's or anything like that. I mean, like I don't feel like there's shades of this character. I, well, I mean, I think that the, there are shades, but not in that regard. I don't. You're right. He's not a. He's not a super uh, friendly guy. There. Um, I mean, there are characters out there that that are that are simultaneously good and evil. You know what I mean? Like, I, you you could argue Clint Eastwood's character, and, and I'm not saying Clint Eastwood's performance is better than Gene Hackman's. It's not. But Clint Eastwood's character is split down the middle, good and evil. Like I feel like you know, good and bad. He's got both of those in him. I'm not so sure that that's the case with uh, with Bill. I think I think there's there's uh, uh, I I think there is good and bad. Um, you know, um, what, what does he say? You, you know, you sir are a cowardly son of a bitch. You just shot an unarmed man or something like. You know, like there's 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 there's. there's I, I, but I mean, like I wouldn't put it past Bill to do the same thing, would you? Oh, I I don't think no I I don't think he would do that. I think that he would he would do the lawman thing and he would you know put your hands up that that kind of. I think that I think that he's a, he's a really principled guy in that movie, and, and, and to the point where it blinds him. Um, so, Jay Money, do you have anything on that? I, I think that uh, uh, Davy Joe picked Hitler as the second most uh, popular character on movies, and that should be enough <laughs> to explain everything we're just talking about right now. Well, we've got another bracket, so we got to move on. We have this is a doble. We got two brackets in this one. This is a first round matchup, and we're in the '40s bracket right now, and it's Miracle on 34th Street versus another movie we talked about in episode 16. Here it is right here. An 8-9. You can't get any closer than the 8-9 matchup. Uh, so, and it's 8 Philadelphia Story, which we talked about in episode 16, one of our more popular episodes, although uh, there we, we, have a t we had a technical error in that one that I'm not too proud of. But um, uh, 8 Philadelphia Story, 9 Miracle on 34th Street. I know uh, Jay Money did the vote on Saturday, so Davy Joe, you get to go uh, let us know what you think uh, right now. Uh, Mir Miracle on 34th Street. Miracle on 34th Street, and why? Uh, uh you know, it, it's. I, I think that the the performance of Gwen, and I also, um, I'm I'm gonna kind of parrot a lot of what uh, Jay Money said in the last bracket. It, it's it's a movie that's that's uh, sort of resonated throughout history in a way that Philadelphia Story hasn't. So, um, I'll uh, I'll go I'll go with uh, Miracle on this one. Um, so it, it's the way it lasted from an iconic point of view. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, and once again, Jay Money, you're going to disagree. Am I? I totally don't remember what I actually said. I mean, it's funny <laughs> yeah, you, 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 you disagreed, so... <laughs> I, I mean, I, you know, I think uh, to David Joe's point right now, I was talking more about the performance spe specifically between Evan uh, Gwen and, and uh, Gene Hackman. Um, I think in terms of the movie itself... I guess I voted for Philadelphia Story a few days ago when I we were talking about it. But well, I guess it was that close. It was that close because wow. I was creating the graphics for the show. I couldn't remember what I had voted for. Who and I was hates like, Christmas now? <laughs> <laughs> Who hates Christmas now is right. <laughs> I don't know. Even now, I'm like, oh, maybe I made the wrong decision. <laughs> I don't know. It's, it's a really close matchup, honestly. Well, you did make the graphics for the show, didn't you? I, I did. And it's <laughs> you like, didn't really oh, consult me. Let's, let's see what you put in the graphics for the show, because yeah. on Saturday it was Philadelphia Story, and there it is. It does yeah. move on. Oh, um, wow. oh, I, oh I, did write it, I did rewrite it down for you, didn't I? I did. I did. I, you know, the thing is, I, I just, uh, I, I was like, as I was looking at it, I was like, did I actually say that? I don't remember saying that now, you know? Um, what you actually said is you felt like it was a more complex uh, complex story and complicated characters. I, I do. I still, I definitely agree with that. It's just which one is the more deserving movie. It's a really, it's still a hard decision. Um, I think that I still feel that way about Philadelphia stories, certainly. Um, I still feel like 30, Miracle on 34th Street is a, a very important and prominent movie at the same time, so... You know, it's really whatever day you catch me on, I think, in this situation. You have to catch me on that day. So. I hear um, that. Well, I mean, good good to know. I mean, like, it, that it could have gone either way. But, I mean, again, it is the 8-9 matchup. As you, yeah. can, as you can see here, th these are supposed to be the toughest ones of the first round. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, David, do you feel like uh, 
American 31st, you got robbed. Are you upset? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to sleep. This is... <laughs> but we were no, running I, late. I do think, I, do think it, I, I disagree with it, but I'll be all right. With that. Okay. And if you want to okay. hear us talking about Philadelphia Story, you can see our full discussion of it uh, in episode 16.3, which is found on YouTube. Interestingly enough, in that episode, Philadelphia Story lost in its bracket. I believe it went up against Chinatown. Um, wow. and I don't remember what bracket it was. Best Picture Losers, maybe? Um, and it, I think it lost whatever bracket it was in. But regardless... Uh, so that's that's our classic movie discussion for tonight. We covered a lot of ground. Uh, a lot. The Miracle on 34 Street got intense. J Money does not, in spite of the hat, does not have the Christmas spirit this this year. You would, no, no, no. Go back and watch it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so next up is our sound off, our free form segment that's getting less and less free form. But uh, you know, D Davey's gonna have his diatribe. J Money's gonna do something Christmas related. I have no idea what. It'll be a surprise to all. I've got a surprise for Davey, uh, sort of. Uh, and I also do my top five Christmas movies of all time, uh, based on our discussion, Miracle on 34th Street. That's going to be happening in three to four minutes, so check us out, 10 o'clock-ish Eastern, 7 o'clock-ish Pacific. This has been our discussion, Miracle on 34th Street, No Name Cinema Society. Uh, and next time, our classic, which is going to be on January 6th at 9 o'clock uh, Eastern, 10 9 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Pacific, is... Uh, oh, I forgot my... Oh, yeah. It was co-written by a blacklisted screenwriter who got his credit re-put on the film in 2003. That might be our easiest clue uh, that we've ever done, given given a certain movie that's been in theaters lately. Yeah. Um, so obvious. Is it too easy? I have no idea what we're talking about, so... Okay, really? so our next classic, co-written by a blacklisted screenwriter that had his credit re-put on the film in 2003. That's your trivia. Uh, and that's going to be our class movie for discussion on January 6th. In the meantime, sound off's coming up very shortly.